Esther chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai, we can't go back and retell this whole story, but uh, Esther is a queen. She's a Jew, but the king doesn't know it. Jewess. king doesn't know it. She's kept her national identity secret. She has an uncle that raised her named Mordecai, and he's refused to bow down to the secretary of state. His name is Haman. And so Haman goes into the king, and he says, we've got a rebellious people here that are a threat to you and the empire. We need to exterminate them. And the king says, if you, whatever you see best. And, and so Haman issues this decree to, to kill all of the Jews, all the Hebrews, in this uh, land of Persia. And the Bible says in 4.1, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai ran his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes. These are both uh, Middle Eastern symbols uh, of mourning indicating uh, death. I, my flesh is torn and my soul is departed and I'm, I'm buried, covered up in, in dust and ashes. And he went into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment as decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now, we have talked throughout the course of this study on the book of Esther, and I, I, I'm going to say it one more time because it's, it's essential to our chapter. These are the secular Jews. They are Jews by birth. They are not Israelites by practice. These are the kind of people that think they're going to heaven because they're Americans and Americans are Christians. It's that, it's that sort of mindset, okay? Uh, they, they, the faithful Jews that loved God and believed His Word have gone back to Jerusalem, back to Palestine to rebuild the temple. These are the Jews that stayed behind because their entire their their devotion is not to God but to materialism, and they didn't want to give up their their roots, if you will, in this uh, in this land of captivity. Now, notice in verses one to three what Mordecai does. He rends his clothes. He puts on sackcloth. Puts ashes upon himself. Goes out in the middle of the city and cries with a loud and bitter cry. You, you've seen that in the news clips of these Middle Eastern peoples when they're grieving, how they lift up their voice with that, that dreadful wailing. And the Bible says all throughout these 127 provinces, the Jews are doing this from one end to the other. That's what they did. What are they not doing? Don't read into the passage that they're praying. They're not praying. They're not seeking God. They're not humbling themselves before the Lord. They're just upset. This is what happens in a secular society like ours. When bad things happen, we do something religious, but we leave Jesus Christ out of it. When bad things happen, we, we mourn, we cry, we weep, we express our grief and sorrow. We don't change our ways. We don't repent. Nobody suggested in, in, in the major mainstream outlets other than perhaps uh, Franklin Graham, I don't remember anybody suggesting after 9-11 that we repent of our sins as a nation just that we offer up prayers or light some candles. I remember a great national mourning, a great national distress, which gave way to a great national anger. I didn't see a great turning to God. I didn't even see a small turning to God. This is what happens in a secular society where God has been pushed away. He's, he's there somewhere, but He's too far out for us to get in touch with. He's too irrelevant to speak to our hearts and, and cause us to amend our ways. But things are really bad. Let's do something religious. I like when people gather at the courthouse and walk around in a circle with lit candles. Would anybody tell me what in the world that accomplishes? Well, I know things are going to work out because we burned a candle. Well, 
Well, they put candles on my cake every year for half a century and hadn't changed a whole lot. <laughs> cake has to keep getting bigger and bigger to accommodate the... So notice, notice the reaction here. We're all sentenced to die. Let's mourn. We're all sentenced to die. Let's wail. We're all sentenced to die. Let's feel bad about it. Well, you know what? If that's all you've got, you're going to die. Verse 4. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved. And she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. We're all going to die. Oh, that's bad news. Yes, Mordecai ran his clothes. Oh, well, send him some new clothes. We don't want him to die dressed like that. America's been attacked. Oh, well, let's give some people some money. Look, I'm not saying that wasn't a nice thing to do, but that doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't get to the root of the situation. A hurricane hit, what do we do? I think it's great. We send bottled water, and we send food, and we send clothing. But once they've eaten, once they've had food to drink, once they've had clothes, once they've moved back into their houses, they still need God. A secular nation doesn't touch on that. A secular nation meets the need of the hour, but not the pressing, eternal, long-lasting need. The queen says, oh, Mordecai in his clothes, well, let's send him some clothes. What about the decree? What about the cause for the decree? You're in a land you don't belong in, serving mammon instead of God. You've sought material things instead of spiritual things. Now you've gotten yourself in this bind, turn to God. It's not part of the consciousness. He says in verse number 4, she sent raiment clothed Mordecai. And take away a sackcloth from it, but he received it not. Then called Esther to Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. Apparently, the news she got is Mordecai is wearing sackcloth and ashes. And, and now she's sending this word, so go find out why he won't put on these decent clothes. Go find out why he won't... Uh, get over this this whole morning thing. Verse 6, So Hatak went forth to Mordecai under the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay for the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. How would you like to live in a country like that? Now, I know we've got plenty to complain about if you, if you choose to. People go down to the to the courthouse, and if they got money, they can build where you can't build. They can drive where you can't drive. They can eat where you can't eat. But what if a guy went to the courthouse and said, you know what? I just don't like people with mustaches. Here's $100,000, and the county commission says, oh, for that price, you can kill them all. Help yourself. <laughs> you say, now that's something to complain about. Haman goes into the king and says, King, I'll give you X amount of dollars if you'll let me exterminate the Jews. And the king said, Boy, that'll help the national debt. <laughs> sure. Where do I sign? Now, that's something to be upset about. So Mordecai tells that to Hatak, and, uh, and the, the Jews are sentenced to destruction. Verse 8, also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king, to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Now, she sees Mordecai's problem. She's not interested in helping then she finds out all her kinfolk have a similar problem. She's not interested in helping. Verse 10. Again Esther spake unto Hatak, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know. 
that whosoever with a man or woman shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live, but I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. This is very typical. Mordecai says, Esther, we're all going to die. You've got to go in and see if you can do something to get us some help. After all, the king's your husband. And she says, if I go in there without being asked, he could kill me. Hello, he's going to kill you. That's the sentence. That's the decree. What's she thinking? He doesn't know I'm a Jew. I'll escape. All of my relatives will die. I'll escape. All my kinfolk will die. I'll escape. All my neighbors are going to die. I'll escape. So, no point in me getting involved. It's not affecting me. It's not touching my life. It's a bad thing, but I'll just leave it alone. It's a terrible situation, but I'm not sticking my neck out. It's very typical of a society. It's very typical of a, of a Christian community. Verse 12. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Then and only then does Esther decide to get involved. Oh, you mean I'm going to die too? Well, then I better do something. Now, here's where we are. There isn't any possible way that you have, that I have, a heart big enough to care about everything that's wrong in this world. You couldn't handle it. Nobody has shoulders broad enough or a soul strong enough to meet every need that is registered in one day's newspaper. You can't do it. But I tell you this, sin has sentenced the entire race of your people to die. And sin has sentenced the entire human race to death and then hell without Jesus Christ. And you can go through life unconcerned until it gets too close to you. You can go through life saying, well, here, have some clothes so you'll feel better about it. But the truth of the matter is, None of us are going to escape this death sentence. Therefore, all of us need to get into the presence of the king and see if there isn't something we can do to deliver our people from death. And as long as it's just this general... In the back of my mind, I know that someday everybody's going to die. That doesn't move you. As long as it's nothing more than I drive by a graveyard every now and again, or I have to go see somebody at a funeral home every now and again, that's not going to move you. But somehow or another, we've got to come to grips with the fact that death is stalking every single one of us, and the only escape from the wages of sin, which is death and then hellfire, is to get in the presence of the king and find some remedy for man's problem. Most people like Esther. They seek to save their own life and end up losing it. Remember Jesus said that? said in Luke 9, 24, if you seek to save your own life, you're going to lose it anyway. But if you go ahead and risk, go ahead and lay down your life for the Lord's sake and for others, you not only save your life, but who knows how many others you might rescue in the attempt. 
honestly, living in a secular society, and we do, and being pressured by that society to all of us be far more materialistic than we want to be, isn't it very, very hard for you to feel any sense of urgency for the people that are dying round about you? Come on, that's just, that's, that's just fair. And we have so many things to do that are not wrong. But they occupy so much of our energy and so much of our thought life and so much of our time that we scarce have a moment to think of this death sentence that has been passed upon all of our kin. Well, I'll send more to K.I. some clothes and I, okay, I've done something. But you haven't done anything sufficient. Well, I'll tell him to feel better about it. Here, more, and remember, okay, think beautiful thoughts. Dress nice. At least you'll look good laying there. It's not enough. There's a King of Kings in heaven. There's a Lord of Lords in heaven. And he's looking down upon a race that's sentenced to die. And he's wondering, is anybody going to come? Well, he hasn't called me. That's what Esther said. He hasn't called me. Look, you've got a Bible. Everybody in Brazil is going to go to hell without Jesus. Does God have to specifically call you to come and pray about that? Or can you take a chance on just walking in? And here's the word in 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. He has hope in the national promises. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. He said, look, you, whether you get involved or don't get involved, this thing's going to affect you.